Intensity is intensity. High volume, low volume, sets of five, sets of 35, full body or a body part split, it doesn't really matter. If you wanna get stronger, if you wanna build muscle, you need to bring at least some kind of real intensity. I hope you'll keep this basic truth in mind throughout today's video. I made a video a few weeks back detailing the use of time as a form of progressive overload. I focused mainly on calisthenic circuits in that video because I think they're awesome, but the approach can work with anything. To quickly summarize, I made the argument that doing the same amount of work in less time, 100 reps in 4 minutes versus 100 reps in 5 minutes, or doing more work without increasing time, 50 reps in 10 minutes versus 40 reps in 10 minutes is just as much a viable form of progressive overload as adding weight or reps to a single set is. I made the point that increasing workout density in this way is really just increasing strength, same as anything else. I think I finally explained the topic well enough in that video, but it still wasn't quite enough. There's one final argument against it that I need to address. Here's a comment from that video that got me started on this one. I agree that this system builds muscle and endurance. I personally also find these workouts more fun, but they are less optimal than straight sets for muscle growth, because with straight sets you're more fresh for each one, which leads to higher mechanical tension. Maybe I just haven't watched enough YouTube fitness lately, or maybe I just haven't discovered whoever it is that makes the newest beginner-friendly fitness videos, but straight away when I read that comment, I was transported back to those early Athlean X days, listening to Jeff Cavalier talk about the three principles of muscle growth. Mechanical tension, creating as much tension in the muscles as you can, usually by lifting heavy weights. Metabolic stress, essentially going for the pump, uh, accumulating metabolites in the muscle cells, and muscle damage, causing actual micro tears in the muscles. When I first heard about these things, I remember thinking I'd stumbled onto some kind of secret magic. Finally, I could start building some real muscle. I figured I'd create the ultimate program that focused on each principle in equal parts, and in no time, I'd be massive but that's not quite how it works. After a long time thinking like that, you're likely to realize, as is often the case with pretty much everything, thinking in terms of separated parts doesn't always help. It's often much more beneficial to look at the whole, to look at exercise and bodybuilding, strength training and whatever else from a more zoomed out point of view, like the power lifter whose bench is plateaued because his lats are non-existent, or the bodybuilder with shredded 20 inch arms but the calves of a distance runner, or the skinny kid who can't seem to build muscle training hard in the gym 10 hours a week, never missing a workout but eating 1500 calories a day, focusing too much on individual parts will never be a long term solution. No one is likely to become truly great without, at least on occasion, looking at themselves and their lives as one cohesive entity rather than just a collection of independent parts. The separation of strength and muscle is another great example. Everyone has their opinion, muscle gain leads to strength or strength leads to muscle, but either way, who cares? You can't separate them, they go together. Why is this even an argument? It's just another attempt at making things more complicated than they need to be, just like separating muscle growth into three different principles is. This is just my opinion, and it's cool to know what's happening behind the scenes. I'm not saying it's wrong to seek knowledge, but I sincerely believe thinking about your actual training in terms of those principles is a waste of time. Unless you're doing some kind of highly specific training method like using occlusion bands for sets of 100, possibly only causing that metabolic stress adaptation, or doing only max effort singles, mechanical tension, or doing some kind of hit inspired negative focused program that specializes in muscle damage, the three things go together. Unless you're actively trying to do just one of these things, you're probably getting all three in your training in equal parts, and you don't need to worry about separating them. Doing so just complicates the muscle building process. I don't usually do this. I think many guys hide behind research papers to cover up the fact that they haven't actually tried what they're talking about, but when the studies confirm what you've experienced yourself in your own training, it's a beautiful thing. 
For today's video, I went and looked up the current research on the topic of loading recommendations for muscle and strength to better prove my point. A 2021 study by Brad Schoenfeld and others looked at loading recommendations for muscle strength, hypertrophy, and local endurance. I'll link it below for those interested, but the conclusion was essentially that muscle and strength gains are basically the same among all rep ranges above 30% of a one rep max, meaning if your max for an exercise is 100 pounds, you can gain just as much strength and size using 30 pounds to failure as you can 90 pounds. If you want to lift the most amount of weight for a single rep, there is a skill component. You'll need to learn the skill of maxing out, but in terms of raw strength and muscle, there isn't much difference. This further proves the point that separating hypertrophy into separate categories is basically meaningless. Thinking in terms of separate principles, using 30% would probably be seen as a way to cause metabolic stress and nothing else, 85 plus-ish would be mechanical tension, and probably somewhere in the 60 to 80 percent range would be associated with muscle damage, but again, this misses the point completely. 30 percent is enough to cause all of those things, as is 90. So what's the point of all this? Well, those calisthenic circuits I outlined in that time video are well within that range. Unless you're trying to do something like sets of five bodyweight squats when you could do 100, assuming you stick to upper body movements like I suggested in that video, or make sure to do leg exercises that actually challenge you, there's no way you won't be in that optimal 30% plus range. You get enough mechanical tension and everything else training with higher rep sets. Those circuits take you to failure over and over which is what actually matters, using exercises that are hard enough to cause change. I personally believe calisthenic circuits are special because they also work your conditioning, a lot, which isn't something you get much of when doing straight sets, but end of the day, when it comes to building muscle and strength, straight sets, circuits, density training, it's all just the same thing organized in a different way. I actually experienced the extreme end of this myself recently. I've been training with the ab wheel for 8 plus years now, and I never had the desire to master the full standing version. The kneeling version was always hard enough. I did attempt it maybe 3 times in those 8 years, just to see, but it always felt insanely difficult, something well beyond me. It is an advanced move. Well, for a long time now, my training has been 100% bodyweight calisthenic circuits and sandbags. The circuits were done at least 4-5 five times every week, and nine times out of ten, the kneeling ab wheel rollout was included. I recently decided to try that standing rollout again, and first try, I got it. The sandbag training played a role in my strength improving, there's no doubt, but it's obvious to me that training with those circuits made me stronger. High rep training, using exercises that, on their own, would probably fall closer to that 30% marker, led to improved max effort strength. Mechanical tension as a standalone factor is meaningless. Now, I do understand what the commenter was saying. Viewed in isolation, it makes sense that more weight means a higher level of mechanical tension, and if you're fresh, you can most likely use more weight in a set than you could if you went into that set already fatigued. If you're fully rested, you might get 10 reps with 100 pounds, but if you're already worn out, you might need to use 80 pounds to get those same 10 reps. I understand that, but bodybuilders have been proving for decades that the actual load lifted doesn't matter. In that example, 80 pounds is still well within the recommended 30% plus range, meaning reaching failure with 80 pounds is essentially the same thing as reaching failure with 100. The muscle and strength gains would be almost identical. Alex Leonidas made a great point about this in his recent video on strength. When a bodybuilder decides to go into powerlifting, they often break all kinds of records. The bodybuilder might train using a higher rep range and manipulate levers in order to get more out of less weight or do things like pre-exhaust a muscle to reach failure sooner, but that doesn't mean they're weak. It just means they haven't trained themselves to lift heavy weight using the heaviest movements. A bodybuilder might have the strength to bench 400, they just haven't mastered the skill of doing it yet. A couple months spent practicing with heavier weights and they'll lift that 400 as if they'd been training for it for years. You don't need to actually lift heavy to get strong. This is the truth that debunks the claim that straight sets are better because they allow for a higher level of mechanical tension. The tension is high enough when doing those calisthenic circuits. And anyway, just as a side note, what is tension? A muscle doesn't have any idea what tool is being used to train it. It doesn't know if it's lifting a 400 pound barbell in the most optimal way or 150 pound dumbbells from a disadvantageous position 
position. If both scenarios feel like 400 pounds to the muscle, the general gains to strength and size will be the same. The same neurological adaptations won't be there, of course, but as stated before, lifting heavy is a skill and can be trained at any time. If you're still having trouble accepting that a calisthenic circuit can build just as much muscle and strength as anything else, the only recommendation I have left is for you to just try one yourself. Even a basic 10 down, meaning 10 reps, 9 reps, 8 reps, and so on down to 1, with 4 exercises, say pull-ups, dips, inverted rows, and pike push-ups, is enough to make you a believer. The first sets of 10, 9, and maybe even 8 might be sub-maximal, but 7, 6, 5, and onwards, every single set set is max effort. It takes every bit of strength you have to complete those reps. This is more than enough to cause all three of those principles of muscle gain, mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage. And the best part is, by truly pushing yourself to your limit, by attacking your workouts with real intensity, you won't even need to think about any of them. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for the comment about mechanical tension. It's good to be challenged, and I think it led to a cool video. If you're interested in calisthenic circuits and want to know more about how they work in a full program and how they can be used to add a lot of muscle to your frame while turning you into an endurance machine, I recently released a book and training program called Sandbag Hypertrophy, the complete sandbag training manual. The book is a unique take on using sandbags and calisthenic circuits to create the ultimate hybrid athlete. If you're interested, I'll have have a link to the book on Amazon, as well as a link to the 25-minute video I made going over one of the programs from the book in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.